So for all of you who are coming from the last long video I did on analog horror, you all know what's up. After going through and watching season 1, Monument Mythos quickly became my favorite analog horror series on YouTube. It truly feels the most unique out of the bunch, with how much attention to detail and world building there is all throughout. If you are here and didn't see my last video on analog horror, and have no idea what Monument Mythos is, then I would go and watch that video since that covers all of season 1, as this video we are going to be going over the entirety of the second season, which, oh boy, this one gets incredibly wild, let me tell ya. I don't want to waste any more time since we've just got so much to go over, so let's get right on with The Monument Mythos Season 2. First, let's cover some basics that we should at least be already familiar with based off of Season 1. We learned about the Corner Folk, a species that can travel between dimensions through intersecting corners. They come from the corner world and only pop into view for a brief second as they're just passing by. Occasionally when no one is around, however, they might hang around for a bit longer. We learn about how each monument has some sort of sinister secret lurking around it, but what that might be is yet to be too clear. Most of our time is following the universe where James Dean was elected president. That's basically the big marker for being able to tell which timeline you're in. In this universe, Rockefeller was also elected president and plays a big role, being the man who cut down that special tree which sparked the whole debacle with Virginia ending up in the wrong dimension. There's a ton of loose ends that still need answers, so let's strap in and get ready for what they have next for us. Right off the bat, the first episode is called Corner Girl. I'm going through episode order based on how the playlists have them on the channel. There was oddly not a lot of mention of the Corner Folk in Season 1, even though they are the first thing to get established. Hopefully, we will get more info on them, however, throughout Season 2. We start off on a blurry image that I'm not really able to make out while an off-screen voice defines the sides and corners of shapes to us as if we are in kindergarten. Now let's learn about the sides and corners of different shapes. A side or an edge is a line segment that joins two adjacent corners of a shape. However, as he talks, text flashes on the screen. I am not Alex Kansas. I just move luggage. Alex based Riley Tillin on me. She was luggage. You are luggage too. Luggage is so easy to lose. Watch the corners. Sincerely. Alex's inspiration. As the video plays out, the blurred image starts to become more clear as we see a woman unconscious on the floor. At least I'm hoping she's just unconscious. So this Alex Kansas is a name I don't recognize from anywhere in Season 1, but the channel Mr. Manicore looks like it was originally named Alex Kansas. Maybe it's the creator being the main character. Who, who knows? However, we learn a few things about them. The person filming isn't them. They based Riley Tillin on whoever the person were watching, who refers to themselves as Alex's inspiration. Inspiration for what exactly? Also, Riley Tillin being based on someone? Before the video ends, the person filming grabs the lady's ankle and jumps into the corner world. Whoever this body is gets referred to as luggage, and supposedly, we are also luggage. We know from the first season people actively get brought into monuments and never leave, either to be eaten or supposedly dimension warped for reasons I am still not sure of. We are just going to have to keep watching to find out. The second episode is called May's Movie Maker. We begin with text telling us that before we can finish brushing our teeth, showering, getting dressed, eating breakfast, and even reading the morning paper, popcorn will be ready. If you're like me, your first thought was the popcorn you eat, but not in this instance. Get introduced to Popcorn Prime, the fastest personal computer on Earth. From the looks of it, the background of the video has an old-looking computer being revealed on screen. We then cut to the Maze Company logo. After this, we follow the development process of the Maze manufacturing plants. Starting off on the west side in 1960 and ending all the way to the east by 1971 in this zigzag pattern. We then cut to a tape warning us of a mandatory recall of all personal computers. Apparently, the exist of these computers pose a risk to American lives and infrastructure, and we are instructed to dispose of our computer at our local hazardous tech collection center. We are made sure to be let known at the bottom that the Fourth Amendment does not apply to this, so when they say mandatory, they mean mandatory. We learn that May's Machines was founded by Rob Careers and Rob Watroba in 1960, followed by an image of a large building with their company's logo on the side. Nine years later, President Dean established the Department of Technology that united all major American computer corporations and spent billions towards technological advancement. This at least tells us where we are in the world where James Dean was president, so if things look especially weird and different, which they already do, this would be why. 
In 1970, Mays produced the first personal video camera and home computer, and in 1972 collaborated with the Department of Defense in an attempt to control the true forces of mass destruction. The huh? I can say with confidence that those are our monuments eating people in large numbers. Before we get the next entry in the timeline, we are shown an image of a giant snake woven throughout the US with Project Horned Serpent at the bottom. In 1980, Mays was attacked. We are shown an image, also a super loud noise, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm not too sure what I'm looking at here. It looks as if these large buildings and the surrounding area are all getting electrified. Ten years later, the last personal computer is shut down on national television. When we get to the year 2000, it says we've learned from our mistakes. Control is confidence, and today there are no doubts. Then we are shown another, more smaller size computer, presumably called Maze Movie Maker. Now you can take control, with you underlined there. After, we are then met with the last Maze logo. Was this a huge ad for this new product? We then cut to a video exploring under a Maze factory. We see a little map image before we cut to found footage of the actual building. Before going inside, we see that our person filming is one of the people spraying the messages. With this one saying, beware the monuments, they are all connected, and the military industrial complex grows. I would like to know who was filming this, but we're just gonna have to keep watching. We cut to two sets of feet entering a cave that appears to be under the maze factory. Our editor tells us that the air felt charged, and there were no light fixtures, pieces of equipment, nothing. Not even animals. One of them pulls out a piece of paper that has a section blurred before we cut to actual audio. They reach their hand out and touch the side of the cave before they get electrocuted, and we cut to black before we see a big orb with lightning shooting out. Don't even ask me what to make of this yet, because I have not the slightest clue. We cut and are told to not visit these sites, as they haven't been fed in years. Perhaps this quote-unquote cave they were in wasn't actually a cave, but inside some creature that lays underneath the factory. Could this have anything to do with the serpent image we are shown earlier? Actually, looking back at the image of Project Horned Serpent, it follows the exact same path that the development of the maze manufacturing plants were built along. Before the video ends, we see that the people filming this video were Maya and Nathaniel Arnoldson. From what we remember from Season 1, Maya Arnoldson was the lady trapped as a Lincoln looker. Is Nathaniel the brother that was looking for her at the Grand Canyon? Hopefully as we go along, our list of questions can be met with answers. Our next episode- ooh, I gotta learn how to pronounce that. Suez Canal. Suez Canal. Suez Canal. Mm. Our next episode is called the Suez Canal Crab. This episode actually brings us to pretty recent times as this incident takes place in 2021. A large cargo ship holding plenty of American products called Ever Given is moving along the Suez Canal until it gets lodged in a tight space on March 23rd at 7.44 a.m. We are once again immediately shown we are not in our familiar timeline as Hillary Clinton became president, and we see her solution to dislodging the ship that is costing them lots of money and is completely messing up the global economy. Egypt requested that the United States end the crisis with nukes. They are going to bomb the canal several miles from the ship so that the waves will push it out. This seems a little excessive, but who am I to say anything? The plan ends up working, at least so it seems. The ship looks as if it turns and leaves off the water. At this point, nothing surprises me. Something else that gets introduced is a device called the Twitter machine. It seems like this world didn't advance as far with technology, but we still ended up in similar states. Instead of an app, Twitter is the whole mobile device that looks like a cell phone from the 90s. We view through the feed a bit of people talking about the event with the Ever Given ship. People are asking where it went, while we also learn that all officials have said is that the ship disappeared. Todd Mellons states the obvious, that it got up and left. Why is everyone confused? I don't know, Todd. Ships don't grow legs and walk off, last I checked. We cut to what looks like cell phone footage of the ship, which, you guessed it, seemingly now has legs and is walking along the shore. We see more tweets, one saying that the Americans just released a monster. Nobody asked for a sequel to Attack of the Crab Monsters. Glad to see that it still exists in this timeline. The Americans destroyed the Suez Canal and released a demon. Great. This guy's asking the real questions here. So is the ship alive, or is there something underneath it? On April 11th, reports show that the UN Security Council is saying that the now titled Suez Canal Crab will not be destroyed. The crab cannot be killed without causing damage to the ship. In this day and age, the world cannot afford losing that amount of cargo. 
They are unable to lift any crates from the ship, since once aircrafts get too low, the crab starts to stumble around, and the last thing they need is it falling. The current plan is to carefully manipulate the path of the crab through Egypt. We see as the crab makes its way through until a stop in Cairo. We then cut to a video made by Dr. Disturbing, where we are shown clips of people visiting the Cairo Tower, being interviewed about their visit. Everyone seems to love it, mostly because of how high up they get to go and the views they get to see. We learn about an event, though, known as the 2021 Cairo Tower Stampede. Our narrator tells us that because of the evacuations due to the canal nuke, a lot of these people had to go towards Egypt, and the one area that got it the worst? Cairo. This made the Cairo Tower an intense tourist attraction, and the building manager even encouraged people to all get on top of the tower to get a view of the canal crab walking its path. However, its path changed as it started heading now towards that tower. Even after getting warned, most people inside still stayed, and as the crab headed over, it lost its balance and fell onto the tower, immediately causing many deaths. The initial crash caused death, and then over 1,800 containers tumbled off the ship and throughout the building. In only 20 short minutes, the tower falls over and the crab goes with it. Some survivors were able to be picked up, but the majority of visitors died. The military put people in quarantine just in case they caught anything from the crab. And to make matters even worse, once the crab fell, the ship split off and the open wound spilled gallons of seawater and bodily fluids everywhere. Gross. Most attempts to plug the holes were futile since the ground was just way too slippery. After enough falls, the Egyptian army stopped focusing on closing the holes and focused on evacuating civilians within a three mile radius. We cut to April 17th, two days before the event. Egyptian authorities went public with the fact that the crab had fallen and a huge barrier went around the crab in an attempt to keep the media out. This did not stop helicopters from flying over and capturing footage that would inevitably go viral on Twitter machines. The Anti-Device Association even directly blames Twitter for the disaster due to the Ever Given being overstocked with the device, which weighed the ship down and caused the initial shutdown. The account for the association says that Clinton said the crab is not a true force of mass destruction until it kills people. Ridiculous. The account went on to post plenty more tweets criticizing Clinton and Egypt and everyone involved in the incident. Once an image of a sports car in the debris went viral, it prompted conspiracies believing that the Cairo exclusion was a way to keep American goods in Egypt and that the American people have been robbed. That's a quick way to rile everyone up. What came because of this was absolutely insane. The ADA did nothing to help after posting that the specific sports car was last seen at an Egyptian soldier's home, and that these products must be rescued by their rightful owners. Uh-oh. April 19th became Finders Keepers Day, which urged Americans to flood the site and take what is rightfully theirs. April 18th, a day prior, officials were not sure they would see much disturbances other than just a couple intruders. At 5 a.m. on the day, Almost 20 million gallons of fluid got picked up due to extensive efforts to get it cleaned up. Mats were placed so that researchers could get close to the crab, however they decided not to continue with this part of the plan and to instead wait until the sun soaked up the rest of the water. However, over 12,000 people stood around the exclusion zone, where 4,000 guards were behind. Once someone shot a guard in the face, all hell broke loose. Tear gas went out to the mob as more methods were used to try to keep crowd control. Attempts were made for crowd control, except the front gate went completely down, and the people had free access. People were ripping open container doors and were just collecting anything they could find. A lot of this so happened to be weaponry. As more people surged, more injuries followed. This was due to plenty of falls during the break-in. At 1pm, a Ford pickup truck rolls out of a container and completely crushes a family. People started getting shot, kids started getting weapons, and one kid even shot someone. This ended up breaking out into a gunfight between over 14 armed suspects that included the kids. 13 people simultaneously called dibs on a barbecue grill, but no one survived the fight for it. It's actually kind of funny. Because of all of these people, the sun wasn't able to evaporate the fluids as initially planned. This just led to way more trips and slips. One of the crab legs had a little twitch, which was enough to get everyone sprinting the other direction out of fear. More fearful running led to more slips, which led to more people dying due to trampling. Ironically, the Ministry of Health ordered that no American left the zone, so tanks held guard around the outside as people were trying to escape. It became such a wave of pressure that people were being squeezed to death through the metal bars. By 7.15, 
everyone within a half mile radius had all died. The gates were opened at 8 p.m., and out of the 12,000 people, only 900 survived. Some of these people were found praying to the crab surrounding it. Howard Melrose was able to visit the site a day after the stampede. He describes it as a medieval painting where everyone became one. I have a sneaking suspicion the actual reason they trapped all the people inside was for feeding purposes, but you know, I could be wrong. Episode 4 is Dean Disaster, the story of America's worst TV hijacking. During an ABC News broadcast, viewers were told once again to be prepared for tomorrow, as they will witness the start of a glorious adventure. Because everyone thought it was going to be another incredible TV announcement from President Dean, people were going so far to throw, again, big watch parties. However, this was the announcement they were met with. James Dean's America is hell. But you still don't believe us. You'll hear the truth from James Dean himself. Immediately after the broadcast, all air raid sirens across the country went off, and they were louder than ever before said to have burst eardrums within a four-mile radius. This led to absolute mass panic. Roads were flooded, which was causing the carbon monoxide in the air to go to dangerous levels. Dean went into the shelter, and the White House was placed into lockdown. However, once hearing everyone's death screams outside, he couldn't stay put any longer. He and a group he brought out, all consisting of his staff, went out to start shutting off cars outside. Dean had to make numerous phone calls to various other countries to make sure that no actual nukes had been launched. Dean also sent out the military to shut off every air raid siren since all were still going off. However, when the military arrived, they would see a pile of bodies of prior technicians who died due to stress and the volume of the siren. President Dean even solo missioned a shutdown of the air raid siren next to the White House and was reported to have done it very quickly and easily, except he met very similar injuries. It took three hours before all the air raid sirens were shut off. The next morning, federal authorities advised citizens to leave their shelters and to return home, yet some people decided to stay inside because they were too scared of a potential fallout. They told everyone that there is no nuclear holocaust, a domestic terrorist organization hijacked the Sirens of America. The streets were filled with bodies, so they had to hand out blindfolds to the vulnerable so that they wouldn't faint at the sights. James Dean was at the Walt Disney Medical Hospital. All of him and his staff were diagnosed with severe hearing loss. Against his doctor's advice, he went on the air to make a statement about what had gone down. He was going to go on live TV, but he saw his face and was incredibly scarred and decided to just go radio. Except his audio aired on every one of the air raid sirens so that everyone could hear. Hopefully not at the same volume though. He straight up calls out the Anti-Dean Association on air and advises people to go after people in the association and bring them to local authorities. He also mentions that they aren't too hard to find because of how silly their ideas are and how proud they are of them. Once grabbed, they are sent to specific correctional facilities and, wouldn't you know it, they are all at national monuments. This was said to have been done as a form of symbolism. They only would stay for sometimes a few weeks before being said to return with much better moods and no memory of their life as a member of the association. Yeah, they're being swapped out. Even altered physical appearances. If people are getting swapped, what about the other dimension getting all the crazy people? President Dean had to go back on air to speak about all the requests of going into the facilities after seeing everyone else come out of them supposedly much better. I notice the audio gets really weird when he makes his prison comment. But if we send you to those places too, then those correctional facilities lose their purpose. If we send everyone to prison, then what's the prison anymore? This is Jimmy. A new up-and-coming tech company called Maze, interesting, interesting, quickly provides James Dean a state-of-the-art hearing implant. After how quick and easy the process was and how well it worked, it inspired him to create the Department of Technology. He put up a deadline for when he wanted every citizen to have their hearing repaired. By July 4th, I want every American to hear the fireworks. 
It took 10 hours to get approval for the department. This explains why so many maize factories were being built. July 4th became the day the US was the first country to have cured a deafness. While everyone celebrated, Dean raced with his now best friend, Richard Nixon. This season has been very different from season one so far, and that has been really awesome to see. In the first season, we were introduced to each monument, the idea of dimension traveling, and a general concept of two histories happening at the same time. Except in this one, we are really diving into actual events, and we're able to start piecing some of these puzzle pieces together. Episode 6 is Starry Sphinx, and this episode brings in a whole new can of worms to the table. This episode begins with a video compilation. Video 1 is of recorded footage of a true force of mass destruction located on Mars. Are you telling me this came from Mars? After that, we cut to an audio excerpt from our recognizable friend, Leonard Morlin. He was the guy in the first season who defined to us what a Lincoln Looker was. From what I can gather is that the US was trying to excavate something from Egypt. It is something that Egypt was highly against, but as of right now, I ain't got a clue as to what the excavation is or what they're even trying to get. They do make it seem like there is a threat at large within Egypt, however. Next video shows the TFMD floating away off Mars. I can only guess where its destination is. We then get shown another audio expert from Moreland again, this time clarifying a few questions I had earlier. It appears that once the US classified the pyramids of Egypt as a true force of mass destruction, excavation was inevitable. Ah, so things are starting to make a bit more sense from that previous audio recording. He goes on to say that the UN Security Council had classified TFMDs as the single most dangerous threat to humanity. However, we later see that under the Dean administration, climate change and mankind themselves were put under the same label. Once we get to the next video, we see this big force moving its way into the Earth's atmosphere. The next audio excerpt gets a little wild. We learn that ancient pharaohs had sent out workers called guardians whose tasks involved striking special trees. However, just like we saw with Rockefeller last season, these trees don't go down very easily, so the workers had to take substances so they could continue to cut at the tree for several nights in a row. Yet we learn the goal wasn't to actually cut down the trees, but to divert its energy into repairing itself instead of growing upwards. While the tree's growth was slowed, they built enormous towers around the tree to better contain them. I'm guessing these would be the pyramids. The only other mention of multiple trees, from what I remember, is back in Virginia's story where she was taken to a place where special trees were everywhere. I initially believed it was Corner World, and if that is actually the case, has yet to be seen. Next video is a bit hard to make out, but its description is that the TFMD gets attacked. All that can really be made out are these black circles falling to the ground. Seven of these circles go down before it looks like something in the air gets blown up. This is all assumption since the video quality here is blinding. We go back to another audio excerpt where Morlin explains that the pyramids actually extended way deeper into the ground than they previously thought. Nevertheless, they keep on digging as they have to find a bottom eventually. Except they don't. These pyramids run infinitely into the ground and there was no way they were moving anywhere. It turns out, the pyramids we see are just tips of really, really large buildings. It took three weeks of digging to figure out the pyramid secret. Video 7 is labeled TFMD's False Children Land. The video shown is of another circle looking thing going down at the Sphinx. This was the force that was coming from Mars. Are these circle things the false children? We zoom out and see multiple surrounding the Sphinx before the screen flashes white. Video 8 is labeled false children organize into the starry Sphinx. We see all the children circle in a pattern that resembles the Sphinx. Continuing video 8, it says that the starry Sphinx distracts observers as the mothership flees. Mothership? We cut to a video where it kind of looks like the Sphinx is being moved on some sort of big blue platform that on first watch kind of just looked like the sky, but that wouldn't make sense. Video 9 is labeled The Great Pyramids Rise, and just like we learned earlier, these bad boys are infinite and we see these massively tall towers and as we pan around, there's just an endless amount of them. This honestly makes me think of the Alcatraz attack where the prison had multiplied into numerous prisons. What we see next is a diagram of our present situation, and based on it, we see a sphinx that is surrounded by an endless amount of pyramids. To end it off, we see that it was produced by the Anti-Dean Association. These were the people that riled up enough people to attack the Canal Crab, and look how that ended. I wonder if the Anti-Device Association and the Anti-Dean Association are one, or if it's just a coincidence the names are so similar and the acronym is the exact same. So that was certainly an episode. This has now shown us that these monuments, at least the Sphinx, not all originated from Earth. 
Whether the Sphinx is the only one to come from another planet is yet to be seen. I am still not sure what the false children are, but this monument seemed the most alien given the mention of a mothership as well. We also now get the idea of how long all of this was going on, dating all the way back to ancient Egypt and the construction of the pyramids. We're now in episode 7, titled Giza Guardian. Maybe this directly ties into the last episode and clarifies a bit more. Oh, this one was juicy. We begin on text saying that, weather permitting, we will carry a feed of the Starry Sphinx in Giza on July 4th. It's actually the 4th of July as I write this part, holy shit. After the text, we cut to the live feed from the Maze News Network showing the alignment of the false children in the shape of the Sphinx. I'm not sure if this is the distraction while the Sphinx leaves. Each dot starts to go further towards the ground as they start to split into straight upward lines that continue to fold upwards. Camera looks up, then once it looks back down, all the straight lines became abundantly curved. Once caught on camera, however, the feed immediately cuts out. This oddly kind of reminded me of when the special tree in Virginia's story curved before lightning shot out. Perhaps the fallen children are like special tree seeds. After this, we cut back to another entry from Dr. Disturbing, this time talking about Project Giza Guardian. We learn that stories were told of mysterious lightning strikes happening near the Great Pyramids of Giza. This only happened in the instance of a very rare constellation pattern being in the sky. When lightning would strike the sand on the ground, a very rare mineral called Giza glass would be created and quickly became a black market currency. Since no one really knew which constellations and when, British archaeologists didn't really bother them. Yet in the late 1870s, an Egyptologist figured out these constellations. They arranged a trip to go collect the glass so he could bring it back to the museum. While collecting fragments of the glass, he slipped and landed neck first on a shard of Giza glass and it immediately decapitated the guy. Holy shit. But come to find out, he didn't die. In fact, his head was still able to move around as if he was still alive. Yet over time, his head started to swell and become discolored. They cut this story off like damn teasers. The glass got moved to the museum, but since the handling was garbage, the glass broke into small shards and the people in the museum told them it had now become worthless. President Rockefeller was vaguely aware of what this Giza glass was capable of and immediately ordered it to be confiscated. His administration wanted to use for war, but Rockefeller wanted to use it for other applications. After some talks, segments of the glass got approved to be carved into blades and given to select Egyptian swordsmen and they were assigned to guard restricted areas in the Grand Canyon. This is getting wild and ridiculous. Anyone who found themselves in one of these restricted areas would get attacked by one of these guardians. This went on for decades. I am not sure what to make of this yet, so I will just play the clip. All trespassers who were maimed by the guardians were promised a lifetime's worth of a special concoction which controlled unwanted side effects. However, since the medication's efficacy decreased over time, older victims were promised housing within the Grand Canyon to guarantee their safety and privacy from the outside world but only under the condition that they would lure known dangerous persons wanted by the federal government to the forbidden zones of the national park. From what I can gather, trespassers would get attacked and then they would only be allowed a medicine that made the Giza effects more tolerable if they would go out and lure other more bad people into those restricted areas to then get attacked and killed. On the medicine bottle, we see a big vinegar label on it. In the episode Canyon Crown, when we were last at the Grand Canyon, we see mention of the place smelling like vinegar. This is getting confusing, so I hope things start to clear up soon. We cut to another audio excerpt, except this time from Louisa Crawford, who was the wife of Thomas Crawford. If that name doesn't sound familiar, he is the guy who was building the Freedom Statue, and the statue ended up with his eye somehow. So let's see how this plays out. Louisa explains a bit of backstory between Thomas's relationship with the US, but things start to get a little interesting a bit further on. Thomas took a trip to Egypt to recover Giza glass for the sword of the Freedom Statue. From what I remember, the statue went flying through the mountain in the last season, so this would make sense as to how that was able to happen now. Louisa then goes on to explain that while Thomas was sharpening the glass, he accidentally cut off the tip of his finger. We hear that if he focused hard enough, he could make it twitch. Uh oh. Louisa found no entertainment from this, but Thomas couldn't stop laughing. He said he felt no pain, yet he could still feel the finger. He comes home later and has no hand, but he is still able to fully move his hand at the workshop. We arrive at the day Thomas doesn't return home, however. 
Louisa goes in to check, and once she looks inside the statue, it wasn't just his eyes that got put on, but he cut up his whole body and put himself inside the statue. She said that she couldn't handle his eyes being on the face. She later explains that the police thought she would be devastated to hear the news on Nina, the little girl whose perspective we originally followed this story on, being completely obliterated and squished in the cave. But instead, she felt relief because now she knows she is still alive within the statue. She then says something that sounds a bit sinister given context. Inside freedom, Thomas and Nina are protecting America together. We cut the text informing us that Delaware River Journal was shut down after that Delaware Double broadcast. Still, however, a second organization called the New Delaware Journal continued to operate. We get a peek at a report from the New Journal. This broadcast goes on to explain the story of how the Statue of Freedom came up for sale after getting shot down during the ADA attack on the building. Against every offer of purchase, they moved the statue to a random spot in the Grand Canyon. President Dean explained the decision by saying the rocks won't shoot her down. So now this incredibly dangerous statue with a power sword now lurks the Grand Canyon. After the broadcast, new Delaware journalist Howard Melrose, this guy again, leaked a classified file to the public. The file is a video diagram of the Freedom Statue making its way all across the Grand Canyon, cutting the heads off these people being named below. Our last person is a bit of a concern. Maya Arnoldson got her head chopped off. This isn't good considering we have been following a bit of her brother trying to find her, but we also know Maya was responsible for filming the underground of the maze factory. We then hear audio from Maya before getting absolutely wrecked by the statue. No, no, not now. I'm leaving now. I won't bother you. seen the footage if she had taken her damn lens cap off. Sure, her head went off, but we know that the sword the statue has is going to make it to where she stays alive. She already got mistaken for a Lincoln looker, and now this. Leave Maya alone, goddammit. It seems that Rockefeller sent the Giza Guardians to the Grand Canyon, and then Dean sent this new statue to the Grand Canyon as well, with similar sounding jobs. This episode gave us a bit more information on a bit of previous events. We now know that the Freedom Statue has pieces of Thomas and Nina. Could this explain the reason why the statue was seen as an actual lady when they first discovered her off the boat? Remember they had to skin this person alive to recover the statue from inside. This episode also explains why Maya's brother was looking for her at the Grand Canyon and knew about the canyon crowns that he told his kid about. Episode 8 is called Fallen Fathers and is the second shortest episode of the season at 3 minutes. This one starts out like it's another video put together by one of the Arnoldsons. We are shown a weird moving object with text that says they followed me all the way home. We zoom out, and it is just Mr. Squirrel. Nothing to be worried about. Yet. We quickly cut from Horny to a message to someone who is no longer with them. I'm guessing Maya. Wrong. It was this person's dad. We are then shown a video that might be the day that the dad left or something else, but that's my current guess. We learn that the dad had health problems that made his body a prison. The video we then get played is of the person filming running back inside behind a red curtain before quickly a huge looming shadow comes down. I don't know if this is a big statue's head peeking down or what, but I don't like it. We cut to all black before Tex says, I can't believe it's been three days already, before the dates for Nathaniel Arnoldson's life and death. However, we then flash to Eric Casanis where the dates match up. Huh. Cassanis is also the last name of the creator, so another big... Hmm. If I didn't pronounce that right, the website pronunciation.com did not say it right then. So from what I am guessing is that the sibling duo, Nathaniel and Maya, were uncovering the Monument Mythos conspiracy, and in the process, Maya got her head snatched off, and perhaps a similar fate happened to Nathaniel as he tried to find her, leaving behind Lauren to film these videos for us. Episode 9 is Rockefeller Revelation. Oh boy, there's a lot in this one. This episode starts out seemingly as a direct continuation of the last episode, with another Windows Movie Maker style video being played. Interestingly enough, this video is yet another Dr. Disturbing produced video. Perhaps Dr. Disturbing is one of the Arnoldsons. It couldn't be Lauren, because it's a male voice, but eh, you never know. 
Another connection is that they say their dad passed away unexpectedly three months ago, so it's probably still Nathaniel being talked about. However, we are then shown the Rockefeller tapes, part seven. In our first audio excerpt with Rockefeller, he tells us about a German airship that he was initially astounded by until he saw his name on the side of it. He describes his feelings as a mix of revulsion and satisfaction as he was worried about what others would think at the sight of a foreign airship with the name of an American president dropping explosives upon cities. He further goes on to describe it as the greatest war machine ever developed by mankind, so there was still some pride to the creation. But eventually, the shame outweighed the pride, and he requested that his name be removed from the side. Yet Germany still referred to the airships as Rockefellers. Before ending, he mentions that it was inevitable the American public would find out about his secret dealings with Germany. So all of this airship stuff is under the radar, which honestly makes sense given the context. After this, we cut to a diagram of the airship, where it goes through all of the components. Just like a lot of the other diagrams, I am no engineer, so I don't know what would look off, but the interior looking like a giant person is what's inside definitely doesn't sit right. We cut to a second audio excerpt where Rockefeller describes that once he was debriefed on a situation in the Grand Canyon involving a crown overpopulation, he got the idea to use the crowns as slave labor, given as to how they are only decayed shells of ignoble criminals. I still don't fully understand how crowns work, other than that they're just the heads that got chopped off, and exactly how the Giza glass works if they're using them to like do work. Because according to Rockefeller, these crowns became the perfect workforce. Also, are the crowns just people's heads? I don't see how that would be a very good worker. Someone will probably explain it to me in the comments. We then get what looks like another diagram of an anti-airship death ray. That sounds very menacing. I suppose everything looks according to code in terms of death rays. It looks as if the lens is aimed at something or whatever this weird shape is that we slowly zoom in on. Next audio excerpt, Rockefeller goes on to say that Germany had proposed the idea of using crowns in warfare. Rockefeller kept the information of how much Giza glass they actually had on deck so that he could sell over a hundred canyon crowns over to them. I mean, if Germany had Giza glass, they could just make their own. This alone revitalized the American economy, described as the greatest and most sustainable partnership of recent times. He does also mention that he thought this would unite Germany and America, but as we all know, this didn't go as planned, even in this universe. Rockefeller starts talking about how he would begin to consistently worry about getting assassinated at his center, and that in three years' time, his fears would deem true. After this, we cut to what looks like another diagram, this time called Project Pyramid Plasma. What we see next is a little strange. From what it looks like, a big group of soldiers take the anti-airship death ray to the top of this great pyramid. The ray does what it does best and shoots down the airship. Next audio excerpt, Rockefeller tells us that the public has now learned about his dealings with Germany, but the information on the crowns were still hidden. People are definitely not happy with his dealings, however, stating that the people that stood outside his center who were once supporters now want him executed, enough to where police need to consistently intervene. Here's a bit of the bomb drop. He goes on to say that becoming president is one of the greatest honors a person can bestow, but he sometimes wishes he was just the famous oil tycoon that Virginia Arnoldson believed he was. Virginia being the little girl who got zapped into the other dimension. Things are starting to line up a bit more, but this episode is definitely not over yet. We see what looks to be the aftermath of the death ray being fired, and what happens is that all the soldiers get vaporized into these orbs of consciousness. In confusion, they kind of just float around. Eventually, they all morph together into one being. This body goes on to return to their homeland as one. From the looks of things, they just kind of walked there. But once they arrived, it seems like they had a planned counterattack against Rockefeller. Revenge, as one would say. On May 23rd, 1937, it's said that Rockefeller had entered a bunker underneath Rockefeller Plaza. The bunker door, however, had been melted open with possibly the most powerful heat ray ever built. And that to this day, his disappearance is considered an abduction. We then see two photos of potential suspects. I don't know about you, but I can't see shit out of this thing. One photo shows an empty field with an obvious large special tree. We zoom into the back to get a closer look of something my eyes aren't really able to make out. The next photo looks like Rockefeller Center with the Christmas tree. We zoom in the background again, and it kind of looks like a transparent person standing in the background. And that's where this episode ends. If Virginia is an Arnoldson, then she is the original Arnoldson, and that would make sense that all this strange stuff would be happening to this family, considering I don't believe she ever went back to her real dimension. 
so her whole life has been lived here with, I assume, Nathaniel and Maya being her kids later on. These are all still a lot of theories, so let's keep digging to see if we can get more for sure answers. Episode 10 is Washington Wonderland, and those answers I wanted are finally starting to arrive. This episode is one of my favorites so far in the whole series, so I'm just throwing that out there. After an unsuccessful lobotomy, Virginia Fate Arnoldson provided a more complete account of the Rockefeller Tree tragedy. Finally, some more answers when it comes to this whole story from Season 1. It appears that this is going to take us further into what happened after she got pushed into this world. She explains that when she was little, something went wrong with her. Everything switched, and her new parents did not like her, so they ended up leaving. And after failed foster attempts, she was left at an orphanage with some of her other friends who got sent over to this timeline. She recounts her time in the dark area with all the special trees, describing it like her own wonderland. An interesting reveal is that when she looks up, the special trees reflect upon each other endlessly, the same way when looking down. She also describes that she was resting on floating dust that smelled like baby powder. Last mention of baby powder, I believe, is what they were putting on Mount Rushmore. So I believe this is all the dimensions that possibly exist. She then says she hears distant footsteps before flashes of light and a bunch of people run from the trees. One was a man who approached her with sad, tired eyes. He was the guy who said the trees are not the trees in the first season. He picks up Virginia and walks off. He says something along the lines of that Virginia could be her, promising he will never leave her. Who is this her he was initially talking about? As time goes on, it appears that flashes happen every few seconds and the two of them would be doing something else immediately after, for what it felt like infinity. She was angry at first, but just like the man, she grew sad and tired eyes. She confirms that the flashes take them to another layer of the dust. She says some people tried to climb the tree and became stretched and burnt. She says it felt like her time there was 500 years. She named the man Everett. However, on a random day, all the trees bent and a flash brought her back to New York. The way they bent reminded me of how it looked in the new Delaware Double episode. So I think my theory is true about the fallen children being special trees. When she arrived in the alternate world, she feels very guilty about leaving Everett in the world and is very hard on herself about the whole special tree incident and taking her friends to this other dimension. It's crazy to know how much time she spent in this wonderland before she went to the other world. She also hints that her time at the orphanage was so horrible, she keeps everything to herself. And so after she turned 18, she left and she went to try to find her new parents, but they are no longer together. Her dad is now dead and the mom doesn't allow nobody in her house at all and Virginia continues to blame herself. She goes back to the Rockefeller Center for an answer, and we get another interesting change. She says that she was able to eventually speak to the special tree, speaking like a breeze behind her eyes. Over time, she was able to understand. The tree says she has to be ready to exchange one life for her own to return to her original home, and to return back to the tree in three years. In three years, she comes back and we get another interesting change. She says that she was able to eventually speak to the special tree, speaking like a breeze behind her eyes. Over time, she was able to understand. The tree told her that she had to be ready to exchange one life for her own to return to her original home and to return back in three years. In three years, she comes back and we get another interesting change. She says that she was able to eventually speak to the special tree, speaking like a breeze behind her eyes. Over time, she was able to understand. The tree told her that she had to be ready to exchange one life for her own to return to her original home, and to return back to the tree in three years. In three years, she comes back and we get another interesting change. She meets a man during her wait. Someone who followed her everywhere. She even caught him inside her house. He was a secret agent and he said that he was assigned to monitor her and that as time went on, he fell in love with her. They took each other and grew close. We learn his name is Leonard. She is saying these things in past tense, so I am scared. Together, they had a baby boy whom she named Everett. Nine months into the pregnancy, she goes back to the tree. The tree gives her direction somewhere that was a four-day walk. At a point during the walk, she was able to hear music that felt like the tree's voice. The place she was led to? The Washington Monument. Oh shit. She goes inside and sees a ton of bodies everywhere. We know how this goes. The tree calms her down, and she goes onto the elevator. She says it went all the way up, and music started to blare to the point that she couldn't move. The elevator floor opens up, and she falls. She feels herself hit the ground, but she keeps on drifting down past the ground, 
describing that she fell for what felt like 500 years. But she reached another side eventually where it then felt like she was rising, rising back into another body. Another body that was just like hers, but slightly different. This body did not have Everett. She says that while everyone else exchanged their own lives for themselves, she exchanged Everett for hers. All the bodies were said to be still alive, but couldn't move, bleeding into the ground for years. She asked why the tree kept them all alive, if they liked pain or drank their blood. I'm pretty sure they're still feeling the pain consistently of the fall, which would suck. She also hopes that Everett lives in Wonderland. On a random day, the music grew louder and another flash occurred. She says all the people were back in a field of trees. Helicopters lifted them all out and she was told it was 2003. And she was told everything she knew was wrong and that everyone she knew was dead. They also have a plan to fix her. She apologizes to everyone, her friends, her parents, Leonard, Everett, and asks everyone to remember her. Virginia gets a second lobotomy and never speaks again. We then get shown a series of paintings titled The Right Life, all by Virginia. Virginia, however, is said to have passed away in 1980 and that her son Everett is believed to be the 20th Washington absentee. If I'm being honest, I didn't expect to get an answer to that. I don't know why this episode is my favorite. I think that this series has just done such a good job at world building that once it told this story, all the clues kind of clicked. Granted, I still have a lot of questions. Why did they tell her it was 2003, yet it said she passed in 1980? Unless we're looking at two different Virginias here. We begin on a maze simulation of the strike on Air Force One, the aircraft that went around to national monuments making drops of something. Once it flew into restricted airspace, the Air Force took action. However, when it looks like it got striked, we cut to a screen saying mission accomplished and a map of the United Zones of America. The country split into three zones, Alcatraz Zone, Rushmore Zone, and the Washington Zone. We then get to see the three capitals, which are honestly kind of alien looking names. The bottom text ends up translating to out of three, one. I don't know what that means necessarily. We then get what looks like a broadcast interruption. This says a lot. Talking about the true ruler beneath our feet and that it is time for the underground god to leave. He does not belong here. There's also a world egg that can't hatch without force and the earth must be split open. Once the god leaves, each person will have their own state and all will be peaceful. A thousand states of America are a thousand states of peace. They also identified themselves as originally the Anti-Device Association, but now refer to themselves as the Advocates for the Division of America. And I'm pretty sure before they were the Anti-Device Association, they were the Anti-Dean Association. They plan to divide the land with what they call the Fallen Angel. He landed on the tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This is probably that big group of guys who fused into one. According to the video, he will be a walking atom bomb that can be used to from what I can gather, kill the underground god. We then learn, however, the unification of 1980 was short-lived. However, there was another one in 2003 that probably won't get resolved within the century. Huh. 2003 was the year they told Virginia she was in, but then it said she passed away in 1980. Maybe I'm reading too deep into some things. We then see an image of the fallen angel on the tomb of the unknown soldier. This is probably that transparent guy in those photos who tried to kill Rockefeller which would make sense he was hard to see and why he was transparent. Also, I think he did kill Rockefeller, not tried. That raised a lot more questions than it did answer them. Episode 12 is titled Liberty Lurkers. This episode begins and we are looking at the Statue of Progress. We learn its history and are told it's designed by the same man who later designed the Statue of Liberty. I believe we heard from him near the beginning of the first season. However, we cut to an audio excerpt from an interview with the developer of the Suez Canal. He starts off reading from a speech he would read for the opening of the canal, except he didn't end up reading it. Sure, the speech sounded super nice and all with how the canal would bring pure happiness to everyone who saw it, but he admits that he would be lying to everybody if he said that. He goes on to say that it wasn't even up to him to build the canal, and that the man beneath America ordered him to, and that any night he can go into his dreams. I wonder if we are being introduced to an all new threat. We see an animation of the sinking man, and the forbidden fruit which was animated by the advocates for the division of america it has this silhouette with an axe floating around a tree 
what he is doing is unclear before it appears he winds up falling into what I believe now is generally referred to as Wonderland, the area where all the trees are reflected endlessly. However, it appears as if this one man exists in numerous planes of Wonderland, like stretched out. I wonder if that's what that's trying to say. We learn that for years, the audio excerpts describing Liberty Lurkers were all deemed as faked by American publicists who the public referred to as Liberty Liars. However, one audio recording continues to be disputed. It's from our Liberty designer. He mentions the most painful part of construction that made his sleep go away was the pedestal. They were regularly given changes to pedestal size, like we learned in season one, and that he just tells them to ask the Americans when asked why it's so strange looking. But he knows. He describes the pedestal as a slaughterhouse. A slaughterhouse just for him. What's down there is referred to the Horned Serpent, which is also the name given to George Washington by the Iroquois. Then he says their damned founding father is locked up in my foundation. What is going on here? So George Washington is inside the pedestal? From what I can recall, George Washington was mentioned to still be alive due to being frozen in the river. From looking back, it seems that the Delaware Journal report of George Washington still being alive came out December 27th, 1976, and that the Delaware Journal as a whole seized operations the next day. We are then shown a video recorded inside the Horned Serpent Metastructure, or Wonderland, and we actually get pretty cool footage from exactly what was being described. We are warned, however, that prolonged exposure to Horned Serpent's music may damage our brains. All right, everybody. We are on the last episode of Season 2. Let's see how much gets cleared up. We begin on the Thomas Jefferson quote, The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Seems kind of fitting to this world's situation, almost exactly. After this, we cut to the final upload of Doctor Disturbing, who we now know is an Arnoldson. It begins on Dad's favorite things, part 17 being paintings. Painting one looks nice, as it is the apotheosis of Washington, where he honestly looks a little frightening. Painting two is by James Dean, Road to Happiness. Not too sure what this is, but it looks nice. Painting three is Virginia's painting, Together. Supposedly, three days after this upload, the remains of Lauren and Quinn Arnoldson were discovered in the Grand Canyon, again with this place. So I don't remember any mention of Quinn, so my guess is they are Doctor Disturbing, perhaps. It's said that they were last seen riding on two astonishingly large balloons. Park officials say that the balloons encountered crosswinds, which caused them to fall to their deaths. We all know that that is not how that probably went. Next up, we see the final Delaware Journal broadcast, and this one gets wild. It's an oddly projected image of Leonard Moreland telling us all about how he has been held captive by the Anti-Device Association, and that if we see this video, it means that he's dead. They forced him to read their scripts, and that the words about Lincoln Lookers and the Starry Sphinx were all their words and not his. Hinting at the fact, and I'm pretty sure just outright kind of saying that these two things just aren't real. But whenever he told them he was visiting family, he would go to an underground station and write his own scripts from the New Delaware Journal. Everyone thought an Arnoldson ran the station, but it was solely him. He, he then goes on to say some crazy stuff. Three nights before his death, Alcatraz went silent. From what I can remember, Alcatraz was multiplying at an ungodly rate. Supposedly, it all disappeared while everyone was asleep, but according to Moreland, it definitely didn't, and was all around the country. It expanded ridiculously fast. He goes on to say that Alcatraz had copied everyone overnight, the entire US, and that nobody is the same person anymore. He goes on to quote Dean when he said, if everyone goes to prison, then what's a prison? He then switches it up by saying, if everyone becomes a prison, then what's a person anymore? He then goes on to say he will kill himself with fire and to remember him. For Everett, for Virginia, and for America. He was not going to live as the Alcatraz clone. I was pretty sure Leonard from Virginia's story was Leonard Moreland, but I wasn't 100%, so I'm glad this cleared it up. We then see text that describes that a message is going to be conveyed to the other world in a theatrical manner after their apocalypse. Then it shows us that the two worlds are not lined up in time, it seems, where this event happens in 2016 in theirs, but 2020 in ours. It was concluded that Leonard had a psychotic break before ending himself. Which honestly, if you're not in the loop, that's probably a reasonable conclusion to come to. Next up, we have the Angel's Ultimatum. We cut to another message sprayed behind the Lincoln Memorial. 
It says, the advocates were deranged. They are all ashes now. We will never be weapons again. Leave us alone or join the ash pile. I believe this is referring to all those soldiers who got vaporized. We then see that after a two decade search, the angel was found in Babylon Forest. We then cut to Operation Thunderbird, a CGI recreation by the Department of Technology. It shows two androids learning the Freedom Statue at the Grand Canyon. The statue is then subdued by false children being held captive. We now know false children are just special trees, I think. The energy from the tree reacts with a particle in the air from the statue known as Giza gas, which appears to lock the statue in a pyramid before a helicopter comes and picks it up and takes it to Babylon Forest, where from the looks of things, the angel is at, and the two are supposed to kill each other since the pyramid was supposed to let out the statue upon landing in the forest. We then cut to another warning for loud noises. We see a video of what looks like the Earth. Well folks, Earth doesn't last too long considering it looks like a giant special tree explodes out of the Earth and grows out before another giant bright flash. The patterns flashing on screen r reminded me of the corner world and we continue to look all around as more of these shapes start to come into view. After a bit of all this craziness, we cut to white and Tex comes on telling us that survivors of the Great Division are known as Corner Folk. What? 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 I was wondering why Corner Folk haven't been mentioned in a while. That is a massive bombshell to drop on us at the end of a season. I'm going to have to think about this for a second. So it appears the universe we have been following just got ripped apart, and that the event is known as the Great Division. It's looking like what caused this great division could be the clash between the fallen angel and the freedom statue, given that the angel was described as a walking atomic bomb. Also, from what we remember, the Babylon Forest is the place Rockefeller initially went to cut down the special tree for his center. So maybe this whole thing was a recipe for a disaster that caused the great division, which looks like the complete unraveling of the universe. And it's looking like that is now our corner world. A place I thought was Wonderland, or possibly some strange hub for dimensional travel, is actually an unraveled and strung out universe that got absolutely mollywopped. I feel like things are still going to get even wilder in the next season, and while I hope we even get more answers, I'm not 100% sure. It appears that as of right now, all we are going to have to do is watch season 3 and see if any of this makes any more sense, and then we can get a whole recap on what exactly has been going on in this world of monument mythos.